Before we do the classic ideas of the theories of finance, you got to meet the players. Uh, we got to think about returns, present values, uh, the, the other ways of stating uh, the basic representations. So that's what we're going to do now. Alternative representations of our price equals expected discounted payoff ideas, returns, present values, and how does this stuff look in continuous time? So let's start with a return. Uh, rate of return is just a price one security. You put in one dollar today and you get back what you get in the future. Therefore, price equals expected discounted payoff just reads one equals expected discounted return. So that's the version of our basic formula when the thing we're looking at is a return. Now we thought of this as, as MX determining P and, and now R is in here. And you can think of this one also as, as determining the rate of return. Uh, a low price today is the same thing as a high return from today till tomorrow. It, it kind of expressing things in terms of returns sort of hides that, but that's what's going on. If you have a security whose price is driven down today, that's the way that it gets a high expected return from today until tomorrow. So this equation is still determining returns in the same way that that equation you can think of as determining the prices. The return concept that we're using here, capital R is a gross return, price plus dividend over initial price. It's a number like 1.1, not a number like 0.1 or 10% or, or annualized. People use lots of different units. When you deal with data, make sure that you're using the right set of units. Uh, next, the most common kind of return is the risk-free rate. That's, that's the benchmark that we start at. So what does our basic model say about risk-free rates? Well. Uh, 1 equals E of MR, that's what we've gotten to so far. A risk-free rate is risk-free, so it comes out of expectations, and therefore the risk-free rate is 1 over the expected discount factor. So we've, already, we've got our, our first case where very clearly you can see discount factors are determining something about, about returns. And the mean of the discount factor codes the information in an asset pricing model about the level of the risk-free rate. Another way of looking at risk-free rates, instead of you put in $1 and you get like 1.01, .01, that's a 1% risk-free rate, you can think of it as a bond price. And we will do a whole week on bond pricing. A zero coupon bond pays $1 for sure tomorrow. So its payoff is 1, and its price is E of M times 1, or just E of M. So the same idea shows you that the mean of the discount factor tells you immediately today's bond price. And the risk-free rate is, of course, 1 over today's bond price. How do we apply the same idea to excess returns? We use excess returns throughout finance. Uh, excess return is the return minus the risk-free rate, or a difference of any two returns. Now, an excess return has a price of zero. You can see this two ways. One is you're differencing those things, so the difference of the prices is zero. Another way of thinking is what is this object? You put no money down today. You borrow a dollar and you invest that dollar. So no money came out of your pocket. The price is zero. Price being zero doesn't mean the return is zero. You, you've entered a bet. A bet is another example of no money changes hands today, but then money changes hands tomorrow. Well, with a price of zero, our basic equation is E of M zero. Price zero equals E of M times RE. Again, it, it might look confusing if you, you thought we were determining prices, but no, the price here is given. If the price in some sense falls, that has to change the characteristics of the excess return. It has to promise you more excess returns. Another example, uh, a bet is an example. Leverage is an example. In other words, borrowing money to invest. A long short position is an example where you, you short sell one stock and invest in another stock with no money coming out of pocket today. We look at these a lot because they're very common in the finance world. We look at them a lot also because they, they help us focus on the question. When you're not putting any money down today, uh, excess returns focus on the risk element. It's all about taking risk. It's not about putting money down today and waiting till tomorrow. So we'll look at a lot of excess returns. Present values. Let's look now at, at, at a long-term uh, asset, an asset that pays a stream of dividends. Uh, so XT now will represent the dividends paid on each date forevermore in the future. I'm using X, not D. I'd love to use D, but D gets used for derivative. So that's why I'm going to use that notation. But often I and other people will use D. So you've got to keep those straight. What does the present value formula look like? Well, the price today is the expected discounted 
stream of payoffs. Each payoff gets discounted exactly the same way as we've discounted the one period payoff. In the case of our power utility function, it's ct plus j over ct to the minus gamma. It's that discount factor applied to the t plus j dividend. Or let's write it in discount factor notation. Now we will have a separate mt to t plus j, a discount factor from time t to time t plus j, which is just the ratio of marginal utilities. This is worth looking at now because this is the one that helps us make that jump to hyperspace, to continuous time. Uh, the analog of the present value formula in continuous time, you can just write down. Now it's going to be an integral instead of a sum, and an exponential instead of a power. The ratio of margin utilities is the same, and a flow of dividends. Or in our power utility function, e to the minus delta instead of beta to the j, the ratio of consumption and the flow of dividends. And that lets us define our discount factor. We'll define in, in continuous time a discount factor, lambda, which is the level of consumption, uh, not, the, not the ratio of consumption. So that's what our general formula looks like in continuous time, a ratio of discount factors, which is the ratio of marginal utilities. Now, why does it look a little different? Well, as you saw when we were looking at continuous time, continuous time likes levels. It likes to look at ZT, the, the level of the Brownian motion, not epsilon, the differences. So continuous time will, look, will, will define the levels of margin utility rather than defining right away their differences. So these are, are clearly related. The, the, the multi-period discount factor is the product of intermediate discount factors, and that is the ratio of the continuous time level of marginal utilities. Where did that come from? I just plopped it out, didn't derive it. Well, you can derive it on your own, but uh, the basic idea is, is uh, pretty simple. Your utility function now extends over the entire future. So the investor now looks over an infinite future discounted, or uh, in, in integral notation, uh, the investor looks over an entire future geometrically weighted, and I need a dt there. Um, so, uh, and then with this infinite period utility function, you think about eating a little less today and then consuming the dividends in the future.